Father, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for the truth of those words that we sang about. We just ask that you administer your truth and your grace to each of us. I pray that as we look into your word this morning, you would illumine our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Andy, my uh, foam thing kind of keeps falling off. So if it gets windy, maybe we'll try to put another one on. But for right now, it seems like we're good. Hey, it's great to see you all here. And uh, I can see that pockets where people are not sitting with the sun. So again, as Evan said, if it does kind of shift, feel free to find a shady spot. You know, we've been blessed with incredible weather. I think by my count, this is our 22nd Sunday over the last three years. And we've had good weather every time. So that's been awesome. And we, we praise God for that. Um, also want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online, whether you're at home or on vacation or wherever you might be. Uh, we're walking through the book of Romans this summer, and today we're on chapter 6. Uh, I've titled the message, Should We Keep Sinning So There Is More Grace? Because that's a question that Paul asks in this letter that we're going to be looking at as we walk through the message today. It's challenging for us to be, able to, to be able to hold competing ideas in tension. We tend to view things as either at either or, right? They're right or wrong, black or white. We struggle with both and thinking. Nuance is difficult for us. Throughout the New Testament and Romans, the Apostle Paul's letter that we're studying this summer, we read about a tug of war among followers of Jesus with law and works on one side and grace and faith on the other. The God's people have always struggled, including grace, in their understanding of law. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself as a God of mercy and grace. We see that in various places. But the law that God gave to the Israelites through Moses cast such a long shadow that grace and mercy were often kind of obscured. The Jewish people devoted their lives to the law. They strove to do what God commanded and tried to refrain from doing what he didn't want them to do. But it was difficult, if not impossible, to focus on doing what the law commanded while also receiving God's grace. And throughout the Bible, we see that tension, and it really is a, a, a tension, a, a tug of war, if you will, that's taking place in almost every letter that the Apostle Paul and others write in the New Testament. How do we combine our understanding of grace and faith with law and, and works? Accepting God's grace while trying to fulfill the obligations of the law isn't just, a human, isn't just a Jewish problem, it's a human struggle. Questions we wrestle with include, is salvation and being righteous primarily about God's grace, or is it about my efforts? Where does faith and grace end and my responsibility to do something begin? What is God responsible for, and what's my responsibility? Well, followers of Jesus in every New Testament church struggled with questions about, like those about faith and works and about grace and keeping the law, and you and I continue to struggle with those issues today. In Romans chapter 6, Paul continues his letter to the Romans with these words, and I'm going to begin by reading chapter 6 for us, and then we'll kind of go back through today and look at at different sections of that chapter. As I read, um, I heard somebody do this this week and I found it really meaningful. I was watching a podcast and they said, as I read this scripture, um, try to look for things you've never seen before. And it really is a way to kind of bring the scripture to life as you look about it. What are ideas, what are phrases, what are concepts that you've never really considered before? I'll begin reading at verse one of chapter six. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection like his. 
For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Paul shares a lot of deep truth in those verses, and I hope to help us unpack what he writes by exploring three analogies that he used to debunk this idea that we should keep on sinning. And just so make sure you got it, Paul's question or, or the, the criticism that Paul was getting was, if, if God's grace is released in greater measure where we sin then why don't we just sin all the more so that there's more of God's grace? And Paul's argument throughout Romans and in chapter 6 specifically is, that's crazy thinking. We don't want to sin more so that God's grace is, is more evident. And he gives three analogies for that. First of all, he says we shouldn't keep on sinning because we died to sin and have been resurrected with Christ. As followers of Jesus, we're now dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. How many kids are here this morning? Just want to raise your hands. How many of you here were here last week? If your parents are okay with it, I'm going to invite you to come on up front. And if your child's young and you want to accompany them, feel free. But I'd like them to be kind of front and center as we look at a couple of these analogies. If you were with us last weekend, kids, you remember what we had you come up for? You remember, Owen? What's that? That was the week before. Last week we had, what are we doing this? Baptism, Baptism right. Are we got, okay, kids are coming up slowly. You'll have some partners up here in a little bit. But we had baptisms last week. And um, I asked for the baptistry to be here this morning because in Romans chapter 6, Paul writes about baptism. And I want to give you a bit of an, in, uh, a bit of an illustration pull this out here. Um, Owen, oh, since you were up here first, you want to be a, you want to do a fake baptism for me? There's no water in this. Can I show, can I use you for an illustration? Here, I can take your hand. You want to come over here? There you go. You don't need that. Just step right in there and you can stay standing up so people can see you. Just put your hands like that over your chest. That's what we ask you. So just pretend this water's up here high. And uh, I'm going to baptize Owen, and we did this last week with Conrad and with Shauna, and we said we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And he goes under the water. And Paul says that that going under the water 
is associated, associating ourselves with Jesus' death. That when Jesus died, he went into the tomb, and then God, so he's in the tomb. I won't hold him down this long if there was water. In the tomb, died, and then he's raised to life. That's the symbolism of baptism. That as we go under the water, we're identifying with Jesus' death and the hold that sin has on us. As we come out of the water, it symbolizes Jesus' life. Thanks, Owen. Great job. Sorry there wasn't water in there. That's probably been more fun for you. Um, yeah, Owen has a fan out there. Um, I also, um, I, I need a, I need a volunteer. Somebody is good. You good reader, Maria? Yeah. All right. What's that? Okay, great. She read the Bible before. You're not the greatest reader. Well, if I, I might have to help you out. Um, you got a microphone here I can use? There we go. I should have seen that there. All right, Maria. Well, here's the passage that I'm going to have you read, verses 6, 1 through 5. And this is from the message paraphrase, all right? So you just hold the microphone there and start reading. If you need some help, I'll help you read. So, so what do we do? So what do we do? What, we, we keep on sinning. We keep on sinning. I tell you what, how about if I just kind of, how about if you hold the Bible for me, all right? And then I'm going to read it, all right? Oh, you can say it with me if you want, yeah. So what do we do? So what do we do? Keep on sinning. Keep on sinning. So God can keep on forgiving. So God can keep on forgiving. I should hope not. I should hope not. If we left the country. If we left the country. Where sin is sovereign. Where sin, sin is that's a big word. Sovereign. Sovereign. How can we still live in our old house? How can we still live in our old house? Or didn't you realize? Or didn't you realize? We packed up and left there for good. We packed up and left there for good. That's what happened in baptism. That's what happened in baptism. We went under the water. We went under the water. We left the old country of sin behind. We left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water. When we came up out of the water we entered into the new country of grace yep we entered in the new country of grace a new life in a new land a new life in a new land that's what baptism in the life of jesus means that's what that's what baptism that's what baptism into the life of jesus, into the life of jesus means thank you let's give maria a hand i love the way that Eugene Peterson kind of fleshes out those verses, and I think it helps us understand better um, what, that, what that baptism looks like. Kids, I'm going to ask you to stay up here because I have another illustration. This one may seem a little strange. It's not every day I bring an axe to church. <laughs> um, I was going to put it in the baptismal, but I didn't want to scare Owen there. So. The second reason that Paul gives for why we can't keep on sinning is found in verses 12 through 14. Paul says that our bodies, now that we're followers of Jesus, are tools for God to use for good instead of tools for Satan to use for evil. Listen to this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Rather, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. When you and I make the decision to follow Jesus, our bodies, which had been tools for the enemy to use for his purposes, are now repurposed as tools for God to accomplish his plans. When we begin to follow Jesus, our countenance might change. Maybe we're no longer sad, we don't experience as much anger, our language, attitude, and behavior may be very different than they were before, but we're still the same person. It's just that now we're serving Jesus, whereas before we were captive to sin and serving Satan. I want to take this axe as an example, okay? Got an axe here. Um, 
I could do some bad things with this axe. I could destroy some of these cars. I could take this to a building and start to knock it down. I could hurt somebody with this, and I wouldn't do that. But that's something you could do with an axe. But what is an axe for? Yes. Trees. Trees. What do you do with an axe? Trees. What do you do to it, though? Chop it down. Chop it down, right. He uses this axe to chop down trees, and that's something I use. Not that I have other people chop down the trees. That's too hard to work. But I chop up the wood with this. I have Bill chop down the tree. I just chop up the wood. Um, I also use this other side because I don't have a, I don't have a uh, sledgehammer. So when I put tomato steaks in the ground, I use this side of it. All right. I know that's not a correct use for an axe, but it works. So I use this axe for good purposes. But if you wanted to, you could use it for bad purposes. And that's what Paul says about our bodies. He said, before we knew Jesus, we did some bad things with our bodies. We weren't living to please Jesus. We didn't honor him with our lives. But now that we became a Christian and we're following Jesus, the same body that we used to do maybe bad things with, we now serve God with. And God can take our body and the parts of our body and use them for his purposes. There's a scripture that I like a lot in Ephesians that talks about this. Paul writes, we are God's handiwork, and some places translate that masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. Every person, including all of you here and all of you out there, was created specifically by God and designed to use your bodies and who you are to serve him and accomplish his purposes. And one of the things people struggle with, and some of us do as well, but one of the people things in our culture struggle with is, what's my purpose? What, why am I here? What am I supposed to be about? And this verse tells us that God has a plan for your life. God created you to do special things for him. Before we know Jesus, we might do other things. We might... Just like I could use this axe for bad things, we might do things with our body that God didn't intend, didn't design. But after we come to Christ, we give our bodies to him, and then we can fulfill his purposes. Kids, you can go back to your parents now. If you want to stay up here, you can, if your parents don't mind, but you can go back to your parents. Thanks for coming up here. Owen thank, and Maria, thanks for helping me out. So to recap what we've covered so far, Paul says... When we put our faith in Jesus, we can't keep on sinning first because we've died to sin and are alive to Christ. And secondly, because the parts of our body are now dedicated to God and to his purposes, they're no longer dedicated to sin and to our enemy. The third reason that Paul gives in chapter 6 for why we can't intentionally keep on sinning is that while we used to be slaves to sin, now we're slaves to God. Listen to these verses, Romans 6, 15 to 22. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether to sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness that leads to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from those things that you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Paul says that before we knew Jesus, every one of us was a slave, a slave to sin. But when we placed our faith in Christ... We became slaves to God. Now, I understand that slavery has very negative connotations for us, and rightly so. When we think of slavery, we probably immediately think of African Americans who were enslaved by European Americans in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. 
People weren't designed to be enslaved to other people. But Paul's point here, and one that he makes on several occasions, is that all of us are slaves, all of us are controlled by something. We're all controlled by something. If we're slaves to sin, that means we're controlled by it. One of the clearest pictures I think that comes to mind for me when I think about slavery to sin is, is addiction. But we probably all have known and some of us have experienced uh, addiction to maybe alcohol or drugs. And someone who's addicted to certain drugs particularly, um, they kind of lose control. They need to do whatever they can to fulfill that craving, that desire they have for drugs. Whether it's stealing or sometimes killing for it or, or you know, deceiving someone. But they need to have the drug because they're addicted to it. They're slaves to drugs. Now addiction to drugs is an obvious and somewhat extreme example, but we can all be enslaved to sin in many other ways. Things like money, fame, pleasure, sex, food, and the list goes on. And what's interesting about slavery is none of the things that I've mentioned outside of illegal drugs are necessarily bad in and of themselves, but as we become addicted to them, as we become enslaved to them, they begin to control us and, 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 and lead us in directions that we, we shouldn't go that, that isn't pleasing to God. Paul says that when we place our faith in Jesus and follow him, we exchange slavery to sin for slavery to God. Now again, that concept of slavery I know isn't a positive one for us, but when Jesus becomes our master, we're controlled by our desire to please and obey him rather than being controlled by addiction to sin. Giving ourselves to our master Jesus and, and becoming a slave to him results in righteousness, holiness, and ultimately life. So why shouldn't we intentionally sin so that more of God's grace is released? Paul gives three reasons. We died to sin and we've been raised to life in Christ. We've offered ourselves to God as instruments and tools of righteousness rather than what we used to as tools of sin. And third, God, rather than sin, is now our new master. And then Paul summarizes all of what he said with a well-known statement in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The result of sin is death. It may seem fun, it may seem enticing, it may seem exciting, but it leads to death. The wages of sin is death, but God's gift results in eternal life. Sin has consequences. While God's grace covers us and frees us from sin, we live with the results of it. Earlier I tried to explain what Paul said about death and life by demonstrating a baptism. One of the best examples that I ever heard about God protecting us from the consequences of sin actually occurred after a baptism service. Some of you know Greg Motter. Greg was part of this church's uh, recovery ministry. Um, Greg had been freed. God had freed him from alcoholism and drug addiction. He was part of the recovery ministry here and was kind of a leader in that ministry. And, and he had been baptized and shared his testimony. It was a dramatic story of how God had saved him and the new life that he experienced in Christ. And one Sunday after he had been baptized, he had been baptized several years before, he came up to Pastor John and he was just crying. And he said it was amazing today watching children and young teens take the step of being baptized. He said because as dramatic as it is to hear the testimonies of people whose lives have been transformed, maybe they were, maybe they were, uh, addicted to alcohol or drugs or to, addicted to sex and, and, and to see God transform them. He said, those are amazing stories. But he said, as he heard these young children and teens share, he was struck by the reality that God is potentially saving them from so much. That as these children and teens commit themselves, in Paul's language, as they willingly become slaves to God and declare him to be their master, they're sparing themselves from the results of sin. And I thought that was a powerful insight. 
I think sometimes we can, we can really uh, just take great delight in hearing incredible testimonies of transformation and lose sight of how significant it is when children and teens take that step of baptism, signifying their relationship with Christ, and to think about how God can use them as children, as teens, and all that they're potentially spared of as they walk through life is really an, an, amazing, as an, an amazing thought. Greg Motter experienced God, Jesus' grace in a powerful and radical way, but he understood that sin had its consequences. He was deeply moved that Easter morning thinking about how much the children and teens who were being baptized were being saved from, not having to go through much of their lives enslaved to sin. And so as I wrap up today, I want to kind of give a challenge to two groups of people. To those who are here who maybe have never taken that step of placing their faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you to take that step today by talking and praying with a friend or one of our pastoral staff. As we close in a time of worship in a moment, there will be prayer partners over there on that side of the pavilion and back by the prayer garden. Some of us as pastors will be around as well, or perhaps you'd just like to pray with someone you came with or that, that you know. Understand that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, what you're currently doing or what your future may hold, God's grace is available to you as you place your faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Today would be a great day to take that step, switching your allegiance from sin as your master to serving Jesus as the master of your life. And then to those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, I want to remind us that it's God's grace that he extends to us as we place our faith in Jesus that makes us righteous before him. It's not our striving our ability to keep the law, our trying hard to do good works, our commitment to reading the Bible a lot or praying a lot or whatever uh, checklist we might come up with, that's not ultimately what gets us salvation, what leads us to life in Christ. Life in Christ is a result of placing our faith in Jesus and receiving his grace into our lives. As Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 4, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's inclusive of every one of us. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And all, and again, every one of us, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All have sinned and all can be freed by his grace as we place our faith in Jesus. My hope is that as we continue to walk through this study of Romans, that God continues to speak to our hearts about what it means to place our faith in him and to receive his grace. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up as I, as I pray. Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful day. And it really is a reminder to us of your incredible love. Lord, my heart for each person here, and I know your heart, is that everyone would experience your grace poured out into our lives as we place our faith and our trust in you. Jesus, I pray for each of us that we would understand that it's not our striving and our good works that gets us into relationship with you, but it's only your grace that's released to us as we place our faith in you. Speak to our hearts today. Allow us to walk in the freedom of your love, of knowing that we're your beloved sons and daughters, receiving your grace into our lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.